Psalm 8. How excellent is thy name. Uh, Kurt Franklin asked the question that I think is a fitting way for us to begin our time together. And he says, why do we sin? You know, you heard the song. Someone asked the question, why do we sin? When we lift our hands to Jesus, what, what do we really mean? I ask you today, think about that. Like, when you grabbed your clothes and you ironed them and you got the kids ready and you came and you were preparing yourself to come out here, uh, why did you come? And as Sister Gabby and my wife sang to the Lord Jesus, as you helped them sing, why did you sing? What was the the underlying motive behind your desire to gather here with God's people and to ascribe glory and praise to the Lord. Church, I believe that as we look at our, our persistence in praise or, or, or the lack thereof, what we see is that we have failed to see the Lord as clear as we should. I believe that if we would know God better, we would praise him more fervently. Amen. Well, the Psalter does. The Psalter, when, when, it, when it pushes us to praise it, it centers our praise around two things, who God is and what he has done. You don't need to be poked and prodded, and you know how we do in black churches. Come on now. Come on, all right. Praise him with me. And it, it, we should not have to shake you loose and something. I remember like those hour and a half praise services when we were growing up and the first 20 minutes was just the, the, same, the, the, the praise leader just trying to be diligent but the people of God didn't come with warm hearts. They didn't come ready to worship like a lot of us don't. We don't come ready to worship. Why? Because we we fail to ponder on who God is. Do <laughs> Like, I had a busy day yesterday. Uh, you know, it was we had men's meeting, and, you know, that was about a few hours. And then we went from there to, to, to lunch with my daughter. And then I had to pick up my word and begin to finish up and put some touches on my, uh, on my, my sermon. Busy day. A lot to do. You had a lot to do. But did you take out time in all of your busyness to meditate and ponder for just a second on the greatness of God? On who he is and what he has given us in his son, Jesus Christ. You would be like, uh, it wouldn't take much. You'd be like, you're already sparked. You just need to light the fire because you are ready to go. It didn't matter what you what you're going through. It didn't matter. It wouldn't matter how heavy the week has been. No, I've I've, I've been in the clouds thinking about Jesus. I, I've been thinking about the wonder of God and His redemptive plan and the application of that redemption on my life. And so I'm ready. I'm lit, and I don't even need the praise and worship team to get me going because my hand is already in the sky. My voice is already lifted in praise because I've looked at who God is and what he has. What he has done, church, church, listen to me. David, in our psalm before our consideration this morning, he ascribes praise to God, and his praise comes from the overflow of his meditation. David has been thinking about who God is, and he's come to this conclusion that he is ascribing praise to God because he is excellent. You can't muse on the triune Lord and not conclude when you uh, muse accurately that, that, that he is you can't help but conclude that he is excellent. Right. Amen. That he is supreme. That, that he is great. It's no, it, listen, the, 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 the hymnist that said how great thou art was just musing on who God is. And those words just flew, flowed from her, her meditation. 
notice in, in the outline you've been given the proposition where we're going. In the passage, David ascribes praise to the Lord. Why? Because he is excellent. Amen. And David in this psalm of praise extols the excellency of the Lord by pointing to his essential nature, who he is, and the wonder of his creation, namely his special care for mankind, and that is what he has done. I'll read that again. David in this psalm of praise extols the excellency of the Lord by pointing to his essential nature and the wonder of his creation with an emphasis on the, dig the inherent dignity of mankind, which is what he has done. David drives each of us to heartfelt. Well, the, the point of the psalm is to get you to, to get you to the point of praise. To get you to the point of, of worship, we should be singing this with David and feeling the same emotions and having the same mind that David has. This is not just here for our academic uh, contemplation. No, this is here to stir our hearts, to love God more, and to serve him better. So David drives each of us to heartfelt worship. Heartfelt worship by exclaiming God's excellency in two ways. He exclaims God's excellency. He declares God's excellency in two ways. The first way that in David in our psalm declares God's excellency is that he points us to the Lord's glorious nature. He points us to the Lord's glorious nature. Look again at verse 1 and 2. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have established strength. Because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. The first thing that we want to notice in this text. That, that the Lord's glorious nature is seen in the majesty of his name. Notice how David begins. He says, O Lord, O Lord. He says, Yahweh, or, or Adonai, Yahweh, or sovereign king. Yahweh, the one who rules and reigns. Yahweh, the one who governs. He says, your name is majestic. Your name is exalted. Your name is lofty. Amen. Amen. And all the earth. When the psalmist says the name... He is talking about all that God is, all that he has revealed of himself, the fullness of his attributes and his perfections. He says, Lord, you are exalted, all of you, every ounce of your being, every piece and part of you is excellent, is exalted, is supreme, is great. It, that's, a, that's an objective fact, regardless of whether the people in this room or the people in this world acknowledge it. God is excellent in all that he is, in his perfection, in all that he is, in his essential nature. He is exalted. Even if the halls of academia refuse to acknowledge him as the origin of life. He is exalted in the fullness of his being. Regardless of whether we want to take his sexual design and we want to alter it and make uh, changes to how we see gender and how we see sexual preference, regardless of whether we want to do that or not, our God is exalted in the fullness of who he is. It's not dependent upon man and his acknowledgement of God's excellence. No, that excellence is who he is in his divine nature. Amen. Amen. Church, that excellency, it fills the earth. Amen. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. There's no place you can go and God not be excellent. Amen. There's no place you can travel. There's no, there's no, uh, there's nothing you can do or say that will diminish the excellency of our God because he is excellent in his, in his, excuse me, essential nature. Amen. Who he is is excellent. It fills the earth, but I love it. I love it, it because it just, it just doesn't fill the earth. 
his excellence, his, his majesty just doesn't fill the earth, but it is above the heavens. Notice what he says. Who have displayed, or if you have the ESV, it says, you have set your glory above the heavens. I think we ought to read thy name and your splendor as, as synonymous. They're pointing to the same thing. His name, it fills the earth. That's all of who he is. That is who he is in his essential nature. The fullness of his character fills the earth. And then at the end of that verse, his splendor, his glory, the fullness of who he is, is above the heavens. I love this. God is beyond us. He is uh, above us. He is not your homeboy. Our Lord is above us. He is, as the theologians say, transcendent. Oh, he is here on earth filling all the earth. But the earth cannot contain who he is. Right. Solomon understood that he dedicated the temple. He says the heaven, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. I'm building this temple so we can have a place to come to worship you. But you're bigger than this temple. <laughs> this is a great galaxy. This is a great universe. Creation is vast, but there is somebody who is bigger than the creation. He's bigger than time and space. Just you think about Zeus and, 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 and the gods of the Greek pantheon. They're temporal. They exist in time and space. And they're relegated to the laws of time and space, they might be able to fly this, that, or the other, but they don't transcend space. I think we, we were talking about the Norse gods, Thor, and people like that. Well, they died and they go to Valhalla. <laughs> and they consider him to be a god. You watch Thor. His daddy Odin died and went to Valhalla. Loki, so many different Lokis, we don't know how to keep track, but one of the Lokis died. We... <laughs> This, this, is, this is how man conceives of the concept of God outside of biblical revelation. That's right, that's right. We have these temporal ideas about God, but then David says, no, I'm sitting here and I'm laying back and I'm looking at the stars and I'm telling you that God is excellent yeah, right. and his glory fills the earth, but it's not contained by the earth. It is above the heavens. Oh, we would do well. We would do well as Christians. We would be more praising people if we would, uh, if we would lift yes, yes. our concept of God. Amen. Church, church the, the Lord is glorious in his nature. Why? Because of the majesty of his name. Because of who he is in his essential nature. It fills the earth. But it's not contained by the earth. It is uh, above the heavens. Our God is transcendent. He doesn't ask permission to do anything. He's not limited in any way. The only thing that restricts our God is his nature. He don't lie because there's no falsehood in him. He don't sin because he is eternally pure. Our God can do whatever he pleases. He works and he doesn't ask our permission. Thank the Lord. Amen. This God is powerful. This God is yeah. eternal. Yeah. Yeah. He's incomprehensible. I can't, I was trying to, how do I wrap my mind around him filling everything but yet being above it all? Uh -huh. <laughs> David is like, yo, I'm peeping out and I'm looking and I'm like, God, you're excellent. <laughs> the fact that you fill all the earth and that you are above it yet and still. I'm lost in thought. All I can do is praise, right? That's what David says. So we see the Lord's glorious nature in verse 1 because of the majesty of his name. But 2, well, secondly, in this, in this first point, the Lord's glorious nature is seen in the might of his name. So the majesty of his name, catch the M's, and the might 
of his name. Notice verse 2. It says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have what? Established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. You're like, well, how does that point to the might of God? The mouth of infants and, and, and babies. So, so infants and babies, they, this is poetry. The infants and babies, they, they, they point to what's weak, what's helpless. And what does Paul tell us? God takes the weak things of the world to what? Confound the wise. His strength is made perfect in our what? Weakness. It's the fact that we are weak. And, it, and he uses us that, that he has seen us strong. And he says, listen, from the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have a established strength. These babies, it is these babies and these, these, these infants and these nursing babies, it is from what comes out of their mouth that he silences his enemies. That he brings to an end. That's that what he says, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. He brings his enemies and those who have uh, hearts of revenge, he brings them to an end. And he does so from the mouth of the weak and the lowly. Well, what's on the mouth of the weak and the lowly? It's that same name we were talking about in verse 1. It's the testimony of the name of the Lord. That's right. What's on their lips? Uh, what's on their lips from their mouth what's on their mouth what's on their mouth is the testimony the witness the praise of Yahweh they're telling of his name and God is using the telling of his name to silence his enemies Jesus kind of gives us the sense in your own time you can turn to Matthew 20 21 and Jesus uh, the, the babies are singing Hosanna to the son of David. So, so they're singing praise and they, they even know who he is. This is the, this is the Messiah. Hosanna. And then the, 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 uh, the religious leaders are like, hey man, you need to stop them. And he quotes this verse. And he gives us the sense. He, he doesn't use established uh, strength, but what he uses is that, 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 that God will prepare praise for himself from the infants and the, and the babies, so the point is from their mouth, what's coming from their mouth? From their mouth is coming praise. It's coming testimony and witness of the greatness of God. And God uses this to silence his enemies. Let me just a tad bit of application before we keep going. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You don't have to be an apologist to be able to testify of the goodness of God. To be able to tell of his greatness. You can be in a debate with the, the most proficient of atheist scholars. And God can use your feeble testimony of the greatness of his name and the gospel to melt his hard heart. God takes what is weak and he confounds the wise. He's not looking for the most erudite among us. He's looking for you to open up your mouth and to testify to his goodness. David is like the fact that you use the weak and the lowly and their testimony of you to silence those who are perceived as strong. It leads me to praise because it shows me you are mighty in your, in your nature. Your name is mighty. You are majestic. Church, so, and David does it briefly, but he points in verses 1 through 2 to the Lord's glorious nature. And he does it by pointing us to his name. His name is majestic. It fills the earth. It is above the heavens. And it is that same name that is in the mouth of infants and that God uses to silence his enemies. Amen. Guys, still with me? Amen. So David is doing what? He's pointing to the excellency of God. He is, he is ascribing he is ascribing praise to God because he is excellent. And he said the first way we know God is excellent is his glorious nature. But the second way in which David moves us to praise by exclaiming God's excellency is he points to man's God-given dignity. So he points us first to 
God's nature, and then he points us second to God's creation, also that we might be able to see that God is excellent. And because he is excellent, we ought to give him some praise. Amen. Notice what he says. Notice, notice what he says in verse 3. So he points, the second point, if you look at your outline, man's God-given dignity is the second way that, God, that David shows us God's excellency. Notice what he says. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Notice that, 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 that the first thing that we point out is God's special care of man. Man's God-given dignity is seen in the fact that God has special care for mankind. Notice in verse 4, he says, what is man that thou, that you take thought of him? That word thought is to remember. But it's just not like, oh, yeah, I remember that time. You know how we do. Uh, do you remember that time? No, he remembers us. He takes notice of us. He gives attention to us. That's right. That's right. With the view toward moving on our behalf. Right. It's not just a pointless remembering but he remembers you he remembers me he remembers humanity but notice what he says what is man that you take thought of him why are you remembering us and 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 the son of man that's just some, that that's just another synonym for man and the son of man that you care for him care for him is the is the outworking of his remembering he remembers, and then he has practical interest in us. He, has, he is concerned for us. He is moving on our behalf because he has remembered us. He says, why are you doing that? Who are we? What has led him to this course of thought? What has led him to see you? We are very insignificant that you would remember us. We are very insignificant that you would not just remember us, but that you would move to, to help and care for us. Well, what is letting here? No, go back to verse 3. He says, listen, I'm looking at the heavens, man. I'm looking at the heavens and the work of your fingers. <laughs> you ever had a, your child and you're teaching them to count? You get them one of those, one of those, uh, I, I don't know. Abacuses, but they're doing what? The moon is is huge. The stars are bigger than you could ever imagine. But just like Abby is in there, and they got one of those Adam machines, and she's just moving it. That's that's how big God is in relation to His creation. He says, when I look at the heavens, and, and I know that these are just the work of your, of your fingers. The, 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 you are exponentially bigger than your creation. So God is big, and he has a, and, and the created world is huge. I, I remember one time we were, listen, we were listening to this study um, that Brother Gary had brought, and my dad had played the video, and it just, it, it was called Indescribable, and it just talked about the wonder of creation, how big the, the earth is and how big the moon is. And it just showed how vast creation is. He said, listen, God is big. Creation is, is, is smaller, but it is huge. But God cares for little bitty man. Oh, we don't think we're little bitty. We think that we run everything. We have this idea that we are more significant than, than anybody else. We have this high view of ourselves. This idea that you are insignificant doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't hit home because you're like, hold on, brother. I don't, I don't know about you. No, David is he's looking at God who has who this big God that has created this big world and he remembers little bitty man. Yeah. He remembers us where we are in our littleness, in our tininess. He remembers us, not just remembers. 
delivers us, but he has the mind to care for us. David is like, how can I not get my praise on? When I think about his care for me. Just go outside. I remember when we first started going camping. And we was from the hood. I, we, we were from the inner city. And, and we went out there. And the first thing you notice is this black sky. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of the stars. Yeah. And it doesn't end. You just look and it goes on and on and on. That's how. That's what David is doing. He's looking at the moon and the stars and how awesome and how vast it is. And he said, but God is caring for me. Yeah. Y'all making me work too hard. God is caring for me. Don't you know God cares for you? Don't don't you know that he He remembers you? David said, what is man that you would care for us? Lord, I'm insignificant, but yet you, you care for me. And he moves from God's, and he's trying to help us to see our God-given Dignity, or he's praising God for man's God-given dignity. He moves from God's special care of man to God's special creation of man. He cares for us, but then he goes even further than that. Look at verse 5. You have made him, he's talking about man, a little lower than God. That word, I'm, I'm glad that the NASB translated it God because it gets, I think, more to the Genesis account. This big God who's made this big creation and created little tiny us, made us just a little lower than himself. What does the Genesis account say? That we were made in in his image and his likeness. And and the New Testament takes that term. God, it's just the word Elohim, right? It's just the word Elohim. So that's why you got some translations that will say angels, and you got some that will say heavenly beings, and even the, the I think the Septuagint would translate it angels. And that's, and that's fine, but I think we missed the connection to Genesis 1. That, that, that God has, well, he made, he's made us different than all the rest of his creation. He's trying to get us to see that God has given us inherent dignity. He's he's blessing God that God would remember him, he would care for him, and that he has made him and created him the way he has. You made men just a little lower than the angels. Just a little lower than God, excuse me. Just a little lower than God. Just read the, just go read the Genesis account. He made fish, and he didn't say that. He made cattle, he didn't say that. He made, no, he said they were good. He said they were good. He th- they were very good. That is only one piece of his created world. Oh, only one piece of his creative masterpiece that he took and shaped in his image. <laughs> shaped in his likeness. Breathed into us the breath of life. Oh, he says, man, I'm, I'm getting my praise on because he, he remembers me. He cares for me. And he has, he has created me in a way he's created nothing else in this world. Oh, church, you ought to be praising him. You ought to came here with praise on your lips because of the fact that he created you like him. In his image and his likeness. What? <laughs> this is this is the stuff that Dr. King would lean on when he was fighting for That's our right. civil rights. That's right. That's right. That's right. And if you want to talk about correcting any injustice done to humanity, where do you get that right from? Uh, I, I love that secular people want to help in the cause, but what is their what is their standard? They don't have a standard to call out injustice. We do. He made us a little lower than himself. So you ought to treat us like we have inherent dignity. And black folks, you ought to treat white folks like they got.
inherent dignity. And white folks ought to treat Mexicans like they have inherent dignity. And Mexicans ought to treat Asians like they have inherent dignity. We have no reason to have this egotistical ethnocentrism. He has made humanity a little lower than age. Uh, are y'all with me this morning? I didn't even write that down. That's from heaven. We have, don't forget, I, I get excited and then I get the yelling and screaming. Don't forget the point of the sermon. He's telling us that God is excellent. Yes. And because he's excellent, you ought to praise him. Amen. David says, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm praising him because he's excellent. And he says, I'm looking at his nature, who he is, and all of his attributes, and that he fills the earth, but yet he is above it. And I can't help but pray. Amen. Then he says, well, I look at the fact that he cares for me, that he remembers me. He has this vast universe that he has created, and he's bigger than that. But he cares for little old me. And then he's decided that he will make little old me in his image and his likeness. Oh, all right, let me. uh, Is my time up yet? So I want you to notice the last thing that he's given. We've noticed God's special care of man as we are unpacking this God-given dignity. He's he's, He's cared for us specially. He's created us specially, and he has charged us specially. Notice what he says in verses 2 through, through 8. I won't read it all, but he says, I mean, it's not 2, but verse uh, 6 through 8. It says, you make him, and he's talking to God. He says, God makes man, right? God makes man to rule over the works of his hand. He's giving us a special charge. I, I, let, me, let, let, let me keep reading. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Hear me this morning. Go back to Genesis. It's called the creation mandate. Read it again what Pastor Rob read. But he has given man dominion. If you read a theology book, we are called vice regents. He's the king, and we rule on his behalf. Hear me again. He is the king, and we are ruling on his behalf. And there is nothing under this created order that is not underneath us. Oh, we have a stewardship of it. So, so, so I do believe that you, you ought not be needlessly cruel to animals. That's right. And you ought to take care of the environment. Because uh-huh. God has given it to us. That's right. But we have been made to have dominion over it. Right. So we ought to plunge the earth for, for what we can get from it so that it might be able to help us to live here. Amen. I'm going to get in trouble. We, we ought to be able to, 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 to have a little... Have a little steak if we want to have. Listen, we've been given dominion over creation. Creation has been made to serve us. That don't mean you get ignorant with it. And that's what happens most times. We, 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 we uh, splurge. Killing this and killing that. Horrible stewards. But then you make the other mistake of becoming tree huggers. That is politically incorrect. Uh, we will get a strike on Facebook. <laughs> but we become ultra-environmentalists. And, we for- and now the trees become more important than babies. Yeah. Animals become more important than yeah. children. Right. You, wanna, you want me to care for this animal and there's people that need feed. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, yes. creation mandated for us to rule over creation. In God's stead, on his behalf, man has been given special care. He has been given, he has been created specially, and he has been given a, a charge that none of the rest of creation has been given. That was given to Adam and Eve. He didn't tell the tiger, or tigers, you're going to be over all of the cats <laughs> and then bears, you know what I'm saying? You got, no, he said, mankind, whether it's 
whether it's domestic things like sheep. Then he, even in the text, he said the wild beast of the, of the field. He said the birds in the heavens. He said the fish and anything else under there. If that Leviathan is real, you over him too. <laughs> David is looking at this and he's like, yo, I ought to give God praise. He was like, God cares. He has cared for me. He's remembered me. He's created me in his likeness and his image. And then he has given me charge over his created order. Amen. How can I not praise him? That's, the, that's how the psalm is put together. And that's why he, that's why he ends the way he begins. Verse 9, O Lord, O Lord. Uh -huh. <laughs> you saw what he did? He starts, yo, God, you you're dope. Like you, you are, you're majestic. Your name fills the earth. And then he begins to unpack. He says, your splendor is above the heavens. He says, you have cared for man in a special way. You remembered him. And then he says, you are, you created him specially. And he said, you gave him, you gave man a great charge. And he said, oh Lord, oh Lord. Like, you're majestic. We have to give your name. Pray. Next time the choir sings, oh, I, I, it came from here. I didn't know that until I started studying. <laughs> and then you're going to be like, it all the, you're going to know what it, you're going to know what it means in all, he's excellent. He is majestic in all the earth. And so as the sopranos go, oh, you like, all oh, your hands are up because it's telling a truth that scripture teaches. See, I'm back here feeling her thumb. She's ready to go. That is my mark. That's my marker. That's my marker. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Grab her bag and put it back down. <laughs> three. Three applications. Three. App what, what, do I do? what do we do with this? So the application, it says, and I want you to read these three things in light of what is put in the parentheses. We will only persist in praise when we see God bigger. What did Isaiah say? He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And then what did he, he went, oh, woe is me. He just, it, it, something happens to us when we begin to see God bigger. And you just can't say, well, you know what? I see God bigger. You know, I'm a lead, I just, you know, I declare that I see him bigger. No, your perception of only, your perception of him only widens as your knowledge of him grows. And the only way to know about him better, oh, come on. The only way to learn about him better is not to hear a word from your favorite prophet. Amen. That apostle that you like to talk to, which I told you to stay away from, but you love to turn to that channel. The apostle said. <laughs> come on, y'all know I'm I'm like, man, I done preached to these folks for 10 years and they still hanging out with the apostles. <laughs> and my daddy preached to you for uh, uh, 10 years before that. <laughs> You're only going to see God bigger as you meet him in his word. Amen. You got it. So, so you're going through a tough time, right? And I'm in application mode. You're going through a tough time. It's difficult. It's heavy. Your relationship is, man, it's broken. Money is tight. What's going to keep you from depression? What is going to keep you from going in and, and, and cutting yourself off from the world? What is, what, what is going to keep you from there? Understand that the Lord's name is majestic. And it fills the earth. That our God is big. He is in everything. And he is a Above everything. He is with us and among us, yet beyond us and above us. It's, it's understanding his, that he is transcendent yet personal. That he is, he is big enough to fix it, but he is, even though he's big enough and he can fix it, he is here with me. That's right. So I'm going to praise him. Right. Y'all getting tired. So you'll only persist if you see God bigger. And then you will only persist in prayer, I mean praise, 
when you recognize your inherent dignity. God don't make, I remember Terrell invited me to Bangor, and I titled the sermon that I preached, because I don't even think I was supposed to preach a sermon, but that's all I know how to do. And so I think they had me there for a talk, and I was yelling at the kids. They were, <laughs> Terrell looking at me like, what are you doing, man? Well, brother, you know, when you invited me here, what was going to happen, brother? Uh, I entitled that talk, God Don't Make No Jump. God, God Don't Make No Jump. When you sing that as a kid, if you want to, to, to praise, understand that God has been intentional in his creation of you. Oh, I don't look how I wish I looked. See Beyonce, and she's sitting on that ice horse, and you see her, and all of that, and you're like, "That's a beautiful." I don't look like that. <laughs> well, why aren't they coming? Why? Aren't I, why am I not being courted? And then you begin to look at yourself, and you begin to say, "Well, what's going to keep you praising Him?" It's understanding God was intentional in His creation, that He cares for you specially. He has given you an awesome charge. So before you allow yourself to think poorly of what God has created you to be, understand he has made you intentionally. He ain't mess up. I want my this and my that, yeah. No, he didn't mess up. God don't make no We'll be more praise than if we understood that. I, I, I would be more tender, tender to praise when I know that this big God who's created this big world cared especially for me and made me who I am. All right. All right. I take preaching with a, a whole lot of notes. Makes me uh, wordy. All right. Um, three. Third application. We will only persist in praise when we realize... That Jesus is the ideal man. So when we look at verses, uh, I think it's, uh, let me turn to it. When we look at verses uh, 3 through 8, there's only one man that, is, that fills it all. Go to Hebrews, the second chapter. When the writer of the Hebrews Looked at this text, he looked at Jesus. Notice what he says in Hebrews 2, verse 5. He says, For he did not subject to the angels the world to come concerning what we are speaking, but one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Notice what he says at the end of verse 8. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned him, crowned with glory and honor, so that... By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The writer of Hebrews is, is reading this, and he says this is clearly pointing to, to Jesus. It's pointing to the fact that he is the one that has all things subject under his feet. You have to understand, church. That if you're going to persist in praise, if you're not going to fall off into deep and dark times of doubt and depression, you have to understand that this passage, the special care for man that he has, is to point us to Jesus. Because he has cared for us in a way that no one else could care for us. He has died on our behalf and in our place. And because of that, all things are subject to him. And we being his brothers, as we enter into the eternal state, they will be subject to us as, as well. So he's pointing to man 
but he's looking past man generally to the greatest man specifically, namely Jesus Christ. Can I ask you today as I close, do you know him? Have you given him your life and your heart? If not, then why not? We can joy in the inherent dignity God has given us. We can joy in uh, the Imago Dei, the Latin term, right? The image of God in man. But that image is more, loved one. That image is more, and we are by our very nature objects of the wrath of God. And unless, unless, unless you confess your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be an object of his wrath for all eternity. But he's giving you his son who died for you in your place, on your behalf, for your sin, so that you may not have to experience that eternal torment. It got dark that day, and the, your sins were placed on him, on Calvary's cross, so that you don't have to go to hell. But some of you are going to climb over the body of Jesus to get into hell because you want to be there that bad. He's, he's like, yo, I'm right here, bro. You ain't got to go. Excuse me. I got a date with eternal destruction. What manner of love is this? That he will love us and die for us. Well, ask you.